All right, turn to Exodus 21. So after God has wonderfully and powerfully descended upon Mount Sinai, we saw it in fire and smoke with thunder and lightning, with a loud trumpet. And it says when he descended, the whole mountain shook and trembled. And God gave Moses and all the Israelites the Ten Commandments. And as we've seen, the reaction of the people was fear and trembling. As they, It says they backed away. They stood afar off. And so they told Moses, you speak to God. Um, you listen to God. You tell us what God says. But we can't hear from him. If we hear from God, we're going to die. And so they immediately recognize that God is holy, God is powerful, and they knew they needed a mediator to stand between God and themselves. They realized, hey, we're sinners. We need somebody in the gap. And so that's the role Moses would be in, a, a go-between between between the Lord and the Israelites. And then God gave Moses instructions on build, building the altar, and he says, I don't want you to build anything elaborate, ornate. I want it to be a very simple structure as you build altars for me out of rocks, out of you know dirt. And he didn't want their emphasis to be on the altar, but he wanted the emphasis to be on the sacrifices that would be presented on the altar because that's what would enable the Israelites to draw closer to the Lord through those sacrifices so they could worship God with a pure heart. So as the Ten Commandments go out, the reaction of the people was, we need a mediator and we need an altar. And really that's the purpose of the law of God. God's law is holy, God's law is pure, it is just, but it reveals to us that we fall incredibly short in living up to God's standard, which is perfection, His standard of righteousness. And so a sure way to know that people are not hearing the law correctly is, is when someone says, oh, I think I'm keeping the law pretty well. Or compared to most people, I'm really obedient to keeping the Ten Commandments. Or I'm trying my best to live a holy and righteous life. But trying your best does not measure up to the Lord. Comparing yourself with others will never cut it either. The law of God, as far as making a person righteous in the eyes of God, requires perfection, but none of us are perfect. Again, that's really what the main purpose of God's law is, to show us, as we saw last week, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, quote, there is none righteous, no, not one. It reveals to us that we are all sinners who fall short of the glory of God, God's law reveals to us the same things it revealed to the Israelites. We need a mediator. We need an altar. It was Chuck Missler, some of you remember him, who coined the phrase, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. New Testament in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And that's why we go by all scriptures. It's a very true statement. Moses is a mediator in the Old Testament, but... He was just a sinful human being, but at the same time, he's a foreshadow of the perfect mediator, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And that's what we'll talk more about next week. Uh, that's what the, uh, you know, Christmas is all about, is the incarnation of Christ. Only Jesus was f fully God. Only he was fully human. Only he qualified to bridge the gap between holy God and sinful humanity. And how did Jesus bridge that gap between us? Well, again, by willingly laying down his life upon the simple but profound altar known as the cross of Calvary. That's what Calvary means, the place of the skull. That's where he was crucified at Calvary, uh, the place of the skull. So the skull chapel, you can call us that if you want. And it just means the place where Jesus was crucified. That's the place where he was sacrificed for the sins of the world. That's where he shed his blood for our sins. That's where he crushed the head of the serpent, even though his bru uh, heel was bruised. But he destroyed the power of death that Satan held over us. And so all these things in the Old Testament point us to the Savior, Jesus, who alone has fulfilled all the requirements of God's perfect law on our behalf. So when you go through all the laws of God, you realize, I can't keep them, and God doesn't expect us to keep them all because, again, it requires perfect obedience. None of us are perfect. We've all sinned. We all fall short. Jesus came. He was perfect. That's why he had to be born of a virgin. 
He lived a perfect life. That way he could qualify as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. And that's the whole reason why he came. Now, as we come into chapters 21, 22, and 23, we come into a section that is entitled, and it'll be mentioned what the title is later on. It's called the Book of the Covenant. These three chapters is where God gives Moses additional insights and instructions that expound on the Ten Commandments. When Moses presents these words from God to the people, they will all say, all that the Lord tells us we will do, we will be obedient. But as we'll see, though their spirits were willing, their flesh was weak. Now, again, as we look at chapter 21, the first part of it, God deals with the issues of servants and slaves. Servants and slaves, you're thinking, oh boy, this is a section of scripture I've been waiting for. But the Bible has a lot to say about this issue, and it's important that we get the proper understanding of what God's Word says about this, because the enemy loves to take these kind of scriptures and twist them around and make it seem like, oh, God is harsh, God is mean, God wants to enslave everybody, and he's for slavery, and they... The enemy tries to make God's word look ridiculous. They try to make God look foolish. But as we'll see, God's view on slavery is much different than the world's view. Remember, the Israelites have just been set free from 400 years of severe slavery in Egypt by the powerful hand of God. Keep that in mind as we go through this, because these scriptures reveal God's truth, his justice, his mercy, and that he places, and this is the key to all of this, he places a very high value upon human beings, upon humanity. Now, when it comes to this whole issue of slavery, we should all come to the conclusion that the Lord is all about setting captives free. And when you understand that without Jesus, every single human being in this world is a slave, then that'll give you a proper understanding of what true freedom is. Galatians 3.28, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I titled this for no other reason than you got to serve somebody. It always reminds me of Bob Dylan's song. You got to serve somebody. It might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. And it was true. It's a true statement. And the Word of God is very clear. We're all a slave, a servant to either the Lord or to the enemy. Jesus says in John 8 34, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And so we want to know what true freedom is and what does that look like for a believer. So let's look at chapter 21, starting in verse 1. We'll read through some of these verses. It says, Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. So that's, that's a red flag for a lot of people. We'll take note. We'll get to this. But if the servant plainly says, verse 5, I love my master, my wife, my children. I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, a very sharp implement, and he shall serve him forever. So there's a lot to unpack in these verses. First of all, this is referring to a Jewish man who finds himself in debt. Israel would become because they're not there yet, they would become an agricultural nation. And so let's say your crops did not do well for a couple of years. You had to borrow more seed from your neighbor because the Lord blessed his crops for some reason. And then he says, okay, I'll pay you back when I can. Well, then the next year he has another bad crop. 
but this would happen for two or three, sometimes four years. And he says, you know, can I borrow some more? Can I have some livestock? I promise I'll pay you back. Well, in Israel, God told the people that they could not charge interest to their brethren, but they were to help them out. But if you're unable to pay back your debt, then this was an option that God would give them. You would sell yourself to your neighbor as his servant. You would joyfully serve your neighbor because he was taking you in as a brother, as a son if you were younger, and you would joyfully serve your neighbor, and your neighbor would treat you like one of the family, not as a slave. So this was to be a dignified way to pay back your debt, the debt you owed your neighbor. As we'll see in most cases, it was more of a rental in, uh, agreement. They're not buying them and then selling them, but they were buying them or it was like a rental agreement. I'm going to take on their debt. I'm going to take on their family. I'm going to take on their responsibilities. I'm going to help them get back on their feet. But notice in verse 2 that he was to serve for no more than six years, but on the seventh year, he was to be set free and he was not to pay anything. In other words, after six years, he was out of debt. God says he's paid it back. Sometimes it can be paid back earlier by the work he did, but sometimes it would take six years. And that was the maximum that they would serve. So right here we see that the biblical teaching uh, about servitude is a whole lot different than the world's concept of slavery. These were two willing partners agreeing to this arrangement, as opposed to slavery where a person is taken against their will, they're forced to do whatever the owner said, and so God's word is very clear on these differences. God forbids slavery. God will forbid kidnapping. God will forbid human trafficking. He will forbid abduction, and he'll talk about those things later on. In fact, God says that they should be put to death for treating their brethren or fellow human beings that way. Now, God's heart in all this is revealed in Deuteronomy 15. This is how God says you should treat those who are in debt to you. Look at these verses, Deuteronomy 15, starting in verse 12. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally, or just bless him tremendously, from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. In other words, they had to take God at his word. If they were faithful to do this correctly, God was going to bless them. By faith, it's like, okay, Lord, we'll take in our neighbor will try to be a blessing to them, and God would give them even more so they could freely give their struggling brother, brethren you know, a helping hand here. He says, From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. Now, take a look at verses 3 and 4 once again. It says, if he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. At first glance, that looks a little harsh. Man, they're married, and now he can't even go out with his wife. Be careful when you look at this. This is all saying that whatever arrangement was made for the man that arrangement needs to be fulfilled. And whatever arrangement was made for the woman, that needs to be fulfilled also. So if the guy came in single, and he works for a couple of years, and then this woman comes into the picture, she is in debt as well, and he would take her in. Once the six years are over, the man could leave. But he could not take his wife, because she still had two more years to go on her arrangement with the owner. So you couldn't break that arrangement. That's all God is saying here. So let's say they have a couple children and he's free to leave. Their marriage does not change the original contract. But when she fulfilled her obligation 
when her six years were up, then her and the children could be reunited with her husband, and then they would live happily ever after. That's what God is putting down here. Now, we see another option that God gives them in verses 5 and 6. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges, and this will be a contract they would make. He shall also bring him to the door, or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever again look at these verses in deuteronomy 15 starting in verse 16 god says and if it happens that he says to you i will not go away from you because he loves you and your house since he prospers with you then you shall take an all and thrust it through his ear to the door and he shall be your servant forever and this became known as a bond servant or a bond slave they are a willing servant for their master they love their master they don't want to it's like some of you have, have had probably bosses over the years like man this boss is awesome i want to work for him as long as he's going i want to be his employee just because he's such a good you know employer and that's basically what they're saying here you're going to stay with them the rest of your life now it was again a free will decision in the new testament the word doulos would mean this very thing, a bond servant or a bond slave. In the foyer, you can purchase doulos coffee. And that's what it refers to, bond servant. So all the proceeds that come in from its Go Give Hopes, you know, little um, stand out there with the doulos coffee goes into Go Give Hope ministry. So doulos, it just simply means a bond servant or a bond slave. The Apostle Paul uses this many times. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul starts off his letter by saying, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, or a doulos, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So Paul elevates his word doulos, or bondservant, to describe a servant who willingly commits himself to serve his Lord and Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be true for every single one of us. We have all become, hopefully, bond servants. Again, you got to serve somebody. So who better to serve than our Lord and Savior, the one who purchased us with his own blood, the one who gave his life for us on the cross, the one who would buy us off of the slave market of sin because we were all in bondage and slavery to sin. And so we now belong to him. But again, the greatest bond servant of all time is Jesus Christ himself, who willingly surrendered his life completely over to God the Father. He is a, the ultimate bond servant, the ultimate doulos. In fact, Paul uses Jesus as that great example of being a humble, obedient bond servant. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, look at these verses. Uh, I mean, this is what Christmas... That term, this is what Christmas is all about. The incarnation, God himself coming into human flesh, taking on a human body. That's what it all boils down to, the incarnation. So Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he is God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He's not taking anything away from God because he is God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a doulos, a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so Jesus was the perfect bondservant. He surrendered his life completely over to doing the will of the Father. And so when you go through the Gospels, Jesus says over and over again, I only do the things the Father tells me to do. That's a bondservant. I only say what the Father tells me to say. That's the role of a bondservant. For us, there is no greater freedom found than in surrendering 
our lives completely over to Jesus Christ. He's the one who bought us. He's the one who loves us. And so we surrender our will over to the will of God, over to the word of God. And we choose each day to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Hope that's clear. So then he says in verse 7, this is even a little more tricky here, but bear with me. God will make very clear sense of this. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people. Take note of that phrase, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall not deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he, uh, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters, sorry. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. Very important. And if he does not do these three things for her, these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. This was actually a very radical teaching for the day. God is putting up protective parameters so that the women could not be bought, they could not be sold, they could not be abused, they could not be discarded. Back then, women were treated horribly by the pagan nations. They would buy and sell women just like they would buy and sell sheep and goats. They would just use them and then toss them out, or with the sheep and goats, they'd eat them, but they didn't do that with the women, but it was just treat them like cattle. So God is saying to the Israelites, you shall not treat my daughters this way. If there was a financial hardship in the family, they could sell their daughter to a, another Hebrew family with the understanding that that family would treat her like their own daughter. They were to treat her very well. If things did not work out, then her birth family could redeem her back. And God was very adamant about this, and he says, you cannot sell her to a foreign people. Why? Because she was an Israelite. She was a daughter of Abraham. She was ultimately a daughter of God's, God's daughter. And let's say a Hebrew family bought her in order for her to marry their son. It was similar to how they would pay a dowry for, uh, you know, to the daughter's parents for her. Again, whatever terms they came up with, they had to be honored. But this is very important. I mean, so often, you know, they would buy and sell people. They would abuse people. Um, pagan nations treated their women horribly, as we'll see in a moment. But whatever terms they came up with, God is saying, I don't want you to marry her off and let her be abused. In fact, what he's saying here is that if the son, they say, okay, we're, we're going to buy her off, we're pay for their debt, she's going to marry our son, but then in a couple of years before the marriage, the son says, well, I don't want to marry her, I want to marry this other girl, then they were required to treat her like a daughter. She can't be treated like a servant or a slave. I mean, that was a huge thing in this culture. The law is saying that the parents of this young girl could have her back if they wanted to have her back, or if the young man, he was now obligated to treat her just exactly as their daughter, not as a servant. If they did not do this, God says, she's free. All debts are canceled. Again, God is putting these laws in place to protect the women from being taken advantage of. And what a better world this would be if people still honored and respected young girls and women throughout the world. I mean, these are God's children. These are God's daughters. This would put an end to child trafficking. This would put an end to domestic abuse and violence and, and so many other crimes against women. I mean, what God is saying here was a radical idea because God loves them. And it was very important. You know, when I do marriage counseling, sometimes I'll, if the husband's being a jerk, I'll say, you know what? Before she became your wife, she was God's daughter. And because she is God's daughter, you better be very careful how you treat her. 
because God will come after you if you're abusing her, you're taking advantage of her, you're doing things that are contrary to God's word towards her. So this would put an end to so much abuse if we did things God's way. Now, in this next section here, it gets even better. God's going to expound on the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, right? Remember the Hebrew word for murder, as we saw, is the word uh, ratza. Ratza means to premeditate a killing. I mean, you're premeditating murder. You're thinking about how am I going to do it, when am I going to do it, and so you're putting this all together because your intention is to murder somebody. The word harag means to kill, and God does not condemn killing. This is important because so many people say, oh, you shall not kill. It doesn't say that. It says you shall not murder, premeditated. Harag means, and it's used primarily in dealing with those who commit murder. Remember the example I gave on the October 7th. Hamas murdered 1,400 innocent men, women, and children. What Israel is doing is called harag. They are justifiably killing those who murdered their own. So it's not moral equivalency. God makes a big distinction here. So look at verse 12. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Remember the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. So this refers to an adult son that would attack and beat his parents. That was capital offense. Verse 16, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. Verse 17, he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So to me, again, it shows how God values human life. The pagan culture at that time had zero regard for other human beings. Remember what we saw earlier in Exodus. By a stroke of the pen, or just by his word, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, simply said, when a Hebrew male baby is born, kill it. And they said, oh, okay. So they'd throw the babies in the Nile River, or they'd slit their throats. They just wickedly killed them. That's how much they devalued humanity. The pagan nations that God told Israel to drive out of the land of Canaan when the Jews would come into the promised land, those nations did horrible things to children. They would slaughter their children, their own children, sacrificing them to Molech. They'd sacrifice their daughters to uh, Ashtoreth. I mean, they would do exactly what Hamas did to the Israelites, the Jewish people, on October 7th. And God says, we're not going to stand for that. When you come into the land, you need to purge it. And we'll see why here in a moment. So in these verses, God says over and over again, they shall surely be put to death. Because God is a meanie? No, but because God is setting these parameters in order to protect life. If you don't protect innocent life, murderers will run rampant. And we see it all over the world. Only human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. This was the first law God established after the flood in Noah's day. Look at this verse, Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made him. And so, yes, God established capital punishment. And the simple reason one, if you have no regard for another human being and you just kill them, then God wanted that evil person to be put to death. And so if you took an innocent life, God says, then you would have to forfeit your life because obviously you don't care about life. You just destroyed an innocent life. And so your life isn't worth anything either. Bottom line. In Numbers 35, verse 33, God says that murder is like a, per, a, a poison that pollutes the land. Look at these verses. Numbers 35, 33, So you shall not pollute the land where you are, 
For blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore do not defile the land which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell, for I the Lord shall dwell, or the Lord, yeah, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. In God's eyes, murder was like a poison. It was like a pollutant. If it went unchecked, it would bring in greater evil. Now again, God, had, God set up a system where there was a lot of checks and balances. You know, they would bring in the judges. They would have to have evidence. They would have to have witnesses. There needed to be a trial. Things had to be thoroughly examined. And then God would use these judges to rule. Notice in verse 13, God gives the example of manslaughter. He says, however, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. So this was like manslaughter. It was an accidental killing. Later on, when the Jews would come into the promised land, God would establish six specific cities known as cities of refuge. If there was an accidental killing, that person could flee to one of these cities and they would be protected there until there was a trial. Why was that established? Because if you accidentally killed your neighbor, the rest of the family are like, we want vengeance. They, they don't care about the circumstances. He killed our brother. We're going to get him. So he would have this city of refuge. And it was basically the beginning of what we know as a person is innocent till proven guilty. That's what the city of refuge was for. The question is often asked, does the death penalty deter crime? Well, when it's properly instituted, yes. By the way, 27 states in the United States still have the death penalty. But almost every state has put it on hold. And that has led to a lot of other problems in our justice system. But look at these, this verse here in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11. This speaks to our justice system today. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, when someone is 100% guilty and they are protected for years and years because of corruption, because of lawyers who are corrupt, it causes all kinds of bad, unhealthy ramifications. More people rise to the surface. They get emboldened to commit more crimes. Their attitude is, well, after all, if they didn't get punished for what they did, well, then I'm okay too. And it just keeps escalating. That's why we see crime escalating. If you let out a bunch of prisoners, what do you think they're going to do? In these cities where they say, well, we've got no cash bail, you know, they come in. Yeah, they might have beat that guy over the head with a clay. He didn't kill him, but he beat him up. Let him out. What do they do? So often they just do the same thing over and over again. And so instead of families getting any justice for what happened to their loved one, basically their anguish lingers just like a festering sore that never heals. Now, the number one role of government, God is the one who instituted human government. The number one role has always been to protect its citizens. That's the main role of any government. This is not just an Old Testament teaching. Paul says it like this in Romans 13, verse 4. For he, this speaking of our government, is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And so that is what they are to do. They were to make sure that justice was served. It's not just an Old Testament concept. Paul says, hey, if I have worthy of, if I've done anything that warrants death, then I'm not going to stop that process. God, you know, Paul knew. If I'm guilty of a crime that warrants death, then sentence me to death. A lot of Christians today will say, well, what would Jesus do? I got my little WWJD sticker, so what would he do? Wouldn't Jesus just let the guilty person off the hook? Actually, he would not. He doesn't let everybody off the hook. In fact, we are all guilty of sinning against God. We all deserve the death penalty. 
In fact, those who reject Christ die without Jesus. They will experience the death penalty. They'll be sentenced to the lake of fire forever and ever. That's the worst penalty of all. So don't just think he just waves off sin. No big deal. Boys will be boys. What about the woman in John chapter 8 who's caught in the very act of adultery? Didn't Jesus let her off the hook? you got to remember the situation. The Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus who was caught in adultery, and they say to Jesus, Moses and the law said we should stone such women. What do you say? Well, you know, in other words, they're trying to trap Jesus into going against God's law. But did he? Not at all. It says that Jesus stooped on the ground and he started writing in the dirt. He didn't say a word. What was he writing? We don't know. Maybe he was writing their name and a secret sin. We know they all left from the oldest to the youngest. Maybe he wrote down Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. Look at what this verse says. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. In other words, where is the man in this situation? If she's caught in the very act of adultery, where's the guy? They were both to be brought before the legal system, but only her, only she was brought. So in John 8, verse 7, we read, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then we're told Jesus stooped back down on the ground. He started writing again. And those who heard what Jesus said, they were convicted in their conscience. And again, that says they all left from the oldest to the youngest. So the woman is standing by herself with Jesus. And in John 8, verse 10, it says, When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? In other words, has nobody sentenced you to death? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So Jesus never said she was innocent. But he said to those hypocritical Pharisees, if you're innocent, if you're without sin, throw the stone at her first. So Jesus had earlier said in John uh, 3.17, for God sent not his son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this guilty woman experienced reality, that reality firsthand. So did Jesus let her off the hook? Yes and no. Yes, he didn't condemn her, but at the same time, he was very clear, go and sin no more. Forgiveness is not a, an excuse for us to continue living in sin. Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? In other words, if I sin a little more, I'll experience more of God's grace, so should I continue a little bit more in sin? Paul's answer is, certainly not. Don't abuse the grace of God. Jesus died on the cross to set us free from sin, not to continue to live in sin. When he says to her, go and sin no more, it literally means if you truly believe that Jesus is your Savior, then you will repent of your sinful ways. You will turn your life over to Jesus. You will become his bond slave, his doulos, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, if a person deserves the death penalty, or they might even be sentenced to the death penalty because they murdered somebody, does that mean they are excluded from heaven? No. There's no sin that anybody could commit that is beyond God's grace and ability to forgive. After all, Moses committed murder. We saw that earlier in Exodus. He killed the Egyptian. Don't forget about King David. He committed murder while trying to cover up his adultery, guilty of a double whammy. You know, I committed adultery, now I'm going to cover it up by killing Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Again, there is no sin that is outside the parameters of God's grace to forgive. Even the Apostle Paul, 
No, when he was known as Saul of Tarsus before he got saved, it says he says he would have these believers in Jesus arrested, some in prison, and he even had some put to death. He was like a modern-day terrorist. When you think about it. So what does Paul say about this? 1 Timothy 1, starting in verse 14, Paul says, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant, with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This was a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first... Jesus Christ might show all long suffering or patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So he says, He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. You could put your own name in there. Jesus came to save sinners. I'm the chief of sinners. Now, if you want to compare yourself to others, you can find others that are worse than you. That's not a problem. But when you realize, I have sinned against the living God. I know I deserve the lake of fire. But by His grace, He used Paul as an example. He says, I'm a pattern for those to follow. In other words, Paul's saying, if God could forgive me for having followers of His put to death, then God can forgive you. He can forgive you no matter what you have done, no matter what sin you have committed. The amazing grace, the amazing love of Jesus toward all of us sinners is so glorious. Maybe one of the most famous ones, when you think of God's forgiveness, is the thief on the cross. In fact, in Mark's gospel, it says the two robbers were also guilty of murder. So, do murderers get to go to heaven? Think of the thief on the cross. He listened to Jesus, who was being crucified next to him, and he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this is what Jesus says in Luke 23, verse 43. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so like Moses, like Saul of Tarsus, like King David, this unnamed thief is also in heaven. It's never too late. In fact, C.H. Spurgeon, you know, the great preacher of the late 1800s, he said this about the thief on the cross. He said he's going to be rewarded more than anybody, he thinks. He said, think of all the people through the centuries who saw in the thief on the cross that no matter how bad you've been, no matter what you've done, you can still turn to Christ and be forgiven. Think of all the people at the last minute of their life, whether in jail or any other circumstance, and they turn to Christ, and they've gone to heaven. Think of all the people at the cross who saw that faith was enough. That's so true. Faith was enough. He just put a simple faith and trust in Jesus. In other words, he could not add one thing to his salvation. He couldn't get baptized. Uh, I'm kind of stuck here, Lord. What about baptism? Is that required for salvation? No. I can't tithe. I can't even reach my pockets right now. I mean, think about it. He could not add one thing to his salvation. All he could do was put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So I've got a twisted view on the death penalty. How do I look at the death penalty? I love it. But think about it. The death penalty. It, well, who put Jesus on the cross? Some will say, oh, the Jews did. And that's why there's anti-Semitism in the world. Some will say, the Romans did. Pilate ordered to be crucified. What does the Bible say? Well, you and I, were the sinners. Our sins put them on the cross. But even beyond that, in Isaiah 53, it says it pleased the Lord, Yahweh, to put him on the cross. It pleased the Lord to have his son sacrificed. It pleased God. God is the one who put his son Jesus to death on the cross. Why do I love the death penalty? Because the only reason we have eternal life is because of the death penalty. But Jesus paid the price in full when he willingly went to the cross and laid down his life for you and me.